Hi, good morning everyone. Thanks for joining. Today we're talking about geisha culture in Kyoto with local expert P Peter McIntosh. Thanks for joining, Peter. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So, Peter, originally you're from Canada, is that right? Yes, Halifax, Nova Scotia. And you, you shared with me you were a soccer player for yeah. a brief time before you came <laughs> over. Is that in Canada or was that in Japan? In Canada, I was 20, well, probably close to 30 years ago and about 30 kilos ago. <laughs> <laughs> that that happens as we grow up, doesn't it? <laughs> it, does. it does. Grow up and out, yeah. yeah. So then you came to Kyoto. I love your origin story. You came to Kyoto and you were kind of introduced to geisha culture by a mentor, I guess you could call him, someone who took you under his wing and introduced the world to you. Can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, it was totally, it was, well, it's the number one event that changed my life in the past three decades, that's for sure. I was out one night on my way home, feeling quite sick, so I shouldn't have been out, so I, but I decided to stop by a, a club I had a friend, like I had only been in Japan about three months, and I went into this club, or at the time disco, or whatever you want to call them, to say hello to a friend, and a Michael walked in, in all full regalia, just strutted in, and I was sober, so I knew I wasn't seeing things, and uh, all of a sudden she walked out, so me being the curious foreigner, I decided to follow her outside and see what was going on, Like, and I saw her with a, a businessman, so... Uh, up to that time, I'd been collecting telephone cards and postcards of Kyoto, and some of them were the images of the Michael, so, uh, which are the younger Geiko. And uh, I decided to approach the gentleman and show him my card collection and ask him if, uh, if she was one of the girls in my cards. Well, she gave me a, a look as to say, like, take a hike, buddy. But he, he was a little bit more, well, she was very polite, of course, but the look was like, you know, beat it. I'm with a customer. Anyway, he invited me to join him, and uh, that started, you know, out of the blue. I couldn't speak Japanese, I just off the boat, and he goes, hop in. And we hopped in a cab and went to a bar, and I drank orange juice. <laughs> That's wild, your first introduction. And then um, in your information on your website, you talk about how that inspired you to study Japanese, to study traditional Japanese arts as well as well as learn how to drink because <laughs> in, the beginning, well, in the beginning I didn't speak any Japanese. So, you know, I had this introduction and I found out where I could get in contact because the, the Michael and Geek will give you these little name cards. I don't know if I can, let me just show you. Can you see these at all? These oh, name yeah. cards? Uh -huh. Oh, right there. Yeah. Well, so I found out where she lived and I had someone write a letter to thank Mr. Ito. And I gave him my pocket bell number. So that will beeper, I guess, yeah, at the time. Anyway, he would call me once a month, and I decided I had to learn Japanese so I wouldn't, you know, just be oblivious the whole time. So I started studying Japanese. But because I wasn't a drinker, you know, I wasn't very fun for him, the guy drinking orange juice next to him. So I, anyway, so I got a call once a month, and we'd meet, and my Japanese got better and better and better, and that impressed him. So he kept calling, I guess. If he didn't like me, I'm sure I wouldn't have got the call anymore. And uh, then I went away to Thailand in the summer, and I came back. I said, oh, Mr. Ito, I'll have a beer with you now. Then the phone calls became weekly instead of monthly. So he was looking for a drinking buddy, I think. So because uh, his son was my age and was working in the, you know, the after bubble math of uh, trying to rebuild companies. So his, his son couldn't be a drinking buddy. So uh, I was a token son. Yeah. yeah. And and this this mentorship for you into the world of geisha culture in Kyoto is also kind of paralleled in your stories from your documentary that you did about how the older mothers of the tea houses would mentor the younger ones. So not only for the geisha themselves learning how to do the trade or being protected or taken care of, but also for you making connections into that world, you also kind of needed a senpai or a mentor to teach you how to 
have etiquette as a customer. Is that right? For sure. You know, the, first of all, the, the, the geisha world is probably a, quite a unique world, even in Japanese culture. They have a saying, Ichigen san no kotowari. First time visitors are refused or simply said, by introduction only. So Ito san was my introduction. Uh, so, you know, he would show me, how, you know, he was, he was proud that he was a Kyotoite. And this is how Kyoto people entertain themselves. Hired geisha to go for drinking and singing and karaoke and, you know, it was just what you did. So I assume that's just what you did. I didn't realize the cost or how you had to do it in the beginning. You know, I was just tagged along for the ride. You know, I, I think you, I think Mr. Ito, Ito-san, we'll call him now. Ito-san, um, he liked having a geisha on one arm and a gaijin foreigner on the other. Not in any weird way. Just, you know, it showed he was wealthy and well-connected and also maybe a little international. So it was a win-win for everybody, except maybe for the poor Michael Geiko, who had to put up with my pigeon Japanese for so long. But... <laughs> well, you soon got over that. Uh, before we talk about your guiding and the services that you provide, um, let's also talk about your study of different Japanese arts. So, for example, Shodo and mm -hmm. Ikebana. Can you tell us a bit about the different kinds of art that you've studied? Well, I grew up a jock. You know, played soccer since I was five years old. And just at the end of my career, after turning pro for a year until the team went bankrupt, you know, I decided I would wanted to get into journalism. So, uh, you know, get out of jock world. So when I came to Japan, it was an opportunity to kind of expand my horizons and, you know, study things that I've never studied. My mother was a toll painter, so there was always art around the house and beautiful colors. So I started with a sumie, which... Uh, which is the Indian ink painting. And it was actually taught to me by a, a Bolivian who had been in Japan for 30 years, uh, so in English. So I started with to learn how to, to use a Japanese brush that way and then moved into Shodo from some introduction. I can't remember, I found it at a culture center, a very good teacher who told me, you're never going to be a beautiful writer, but you'll, you'll write interesting characters. <laughs> and then... And then uh, Ikebana, I, I don't know, I can't remember my introduction in Ikebana, but it was at the headquarters of Ikenobo. So, and then those with, with learning the traditional arts, you know, I studied karate as a kid, so I, I had some Japanese, how would I say, like philosophy, I guess, embedded in me. So I think with the, each of the traditional arts, when you use the brush, you learn the strength and the weak of each stroke, the balance between white and black on the paper, and with Ikebana, same thing, the use of empty space, ma or kukan, if you want to call it. And also the use of colors that are kind of uh, not the same color combinations we use in the West. So those, those kind of prepared me and then that taught, taught me um, the appreciation of color combination. Then shooting the geisha, I became photography as well. So shooting the geisha, I mean, the best color combinations in the world are on their kimonos. Excuse me. Yeah, you, you talk about also um, learning Japanese dance and how that taught you the best angles as a photographer to be able to capture them in motion. That was really yeah. interesting. So, yeah, I always joke. I didn't learn dancing because I thought I was light on my feet. But uh, although I was a break dancer in junior high school, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> That's another whole other comical story. Um, yeah, you know, I... You know, I got into photography and I, you know, I looked at a couple of the photos I took in the beginning and they were like all off balance and, you know, just oh, oh, so close. It was like, oh, her hands in front of her face or she's looking in a weird direction. So if I learned the choreography of the dances, I figured, or at least not learn them, but at least had a better sense of them. I'd be able to catch it when it was just like this instead of this. So, yeah, it did help with my photography and also... Being an athlete myself, I know the pressure of uh, performing in front of an audience. You know, they're 30, 40 meters away most of the time in the stands. But uh, also, you know, being performing on a stage. I've never performed on a stage before in a dance recital. It's when, especially when the audience is full of geisha and trained professionals. Ugh. So I, I appreciated what they have to do on a daily basis. <laughs> so it gave me a, a total appreciation for the dance uh, yeah, it gave me a better eye for photography. 
Yeah. And then you, you actually took some of the Maiko and Geiko uh, abroad. And then in your documentary about the Maiko and Geiko, which is wonderful, everybody should watch it. And it's freely available on YouTube. That's wonderful. So everybody can appreciate it. Um, but inside, as an athlete and a performer, you're talking about having that that feeling of being on a stage, right? And that's captured in your documentary as well, especially when you take them abroad and then they have to prepare before they perform. And for some reason, that's not something I imagined when I was thinking about Geiko and Michael. But of course, just like professional athletes, they have to mentally prepare, go through the motions before they go on to stage. I thought that was really interesting. Thank you. Well, not only mentally prepare, they have to physically prepare because the Maiko in their full regalia, you know, there's like 15 kilos on there. So they need to get dressed properly. It takes about an hour to do their makeup. And as she mentioned in the documentary, you know, she's used to getting dressed in front of her, her dressing table every day. But when you go to a hotel, you have to worry about the mirror size, the angle of the light coming in. So it takes a lot longer. So I remember when we arrived in Amsterdam, I said, I'll see you in the lobby in an hour. She tapped me on the shoulder and said, no, 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 no. Two hours. So, yeah, so <laughs> physically prepare and mentally prepare. Yeah. The great well, thing is that... Yeah, go ahead. No, we have a great relationship. So they, they could actually sign off. I just give them the order, what they have to do. And, uh, you know, we talk about it. And they trust me to, you know, make things go smoothly. I'll tell you a funny story, though. So we were in England. And one of the geiko says, okay, Peter, what time are we on next? I said, let me go check. So we're in Northern England. So I go ask and I say, um, what time are we on next? They said, oh, about 7.30. So I went, doo -doo 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 -doo. hey, uh, about 7.30. She looked at me and goes, about is not a time. <laughs> so I went back and 7.15, 7.15, thank you. <laughs> so that goes to mental you know, pre uh, preparation. Yeah. About is not a time. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I And then you've got beautiful pictures also of uh, Geisha drinking Guinness in an <laughs> Irish pub <laughs> and traveling on an airplane. So on your website, it, it says you're one of the only foreigners to ever take Geisha abroad without a, a Japanese escort. Is that right? Well, the escorts are there because you can't travel alone with them. But without going through a middle person. The Asian Art Museum contacted me directly the first time in 2004. So I think it was the first time without you know going through an embassy or some Japanese foundation or something that they, they came directly to me. And of course, I went through the tea house, which is my concierge, so to speak, to the geisha world and set everything up through there. So there was no going through any foundations or any embassies. It was just me. So I guess, yeah, I think... I haven't heard of anything that uh, any other events that went on similar to that. So, yeah, it looked like it was a great experience, not only for the people that they perform to, but also for them to be able to travel and share their art. Um, one of the things that you talk about as a guide in Kyoto is, of course, etiquette, which is very important as a customer. So, when they traveled abroad, were the audiences did they have good manners? Were they um, able to appreciate it, even though it was outside Japan? So the first uh, uh, exhibition we did, it was at the Yerba Buena Center in San Francisco, about 750 people. They were actually scalping tickets. It was so, so, such a popular event. But the, the museum did a very good job. They screened questions at the end. So there's no like crazy questions out of the blue. So they did a very good job, and the questions were fine. And to be quite honest, behavior... To be quite honest, when we travel abroad, every time the worst behavior is from the Japanese tourists that bump into us on the streets. They just get their cameras right in their face and chase us down the street. A lot of people might say some, you know, ignorant, not, not rude, but like ignorant comments like, oh, the, look at the Chinese girls walking down the street. You know, they don't know the difference. But, you know, it's not in with malice or, you know, they're not being demeaning. They're just out of ignorance of not knowing. So, but as a whole, it's been very very positive except for when i was trying to get them through customs you know I, I might as well tell this story because a lot of people i hope watch this when i was going into san francisco you have a white male an older japanese lady in kimono 
a beautiful young geiko in kimono, of course, no makeup when they travel, and a maiko with her hair up, which looks like an ukiyo-e woodblock print. And a lot of people associate ukiyo-e with prostitution, unfortunately. So going through customs, I got taken into a different room. We all did. You know, what's your purpose? Are you going to work here? Like, honestly, this was complete rude ignorance. He thought, he didn't say it directly, but I I felt like I was getting interrogated because I was. he thought I was trafficking. Well, thank God, some, another uh, person in the office came in and, you know, we even had an uh, introduction from the museum itself, written, a beautiful introduction, invitation. And the other person in the room said, yes, I saw, they're coming, I saw it in the newspaper. Anyway, so after what a half hour, they said, okay, you can go. But what ticked me off the most is after a half hour of grilling me, they said, okay, you can go now. Can we get a picture with them? Uh, so, you know, they... Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, I mean, entertainment industry, you can, they worked alongside of prostitutes. I mean, it was, you were, there was one industry, entertainment industry, and everything was involved in it, you know, gambling, criminal, you know, criminal enterprises, everything was in the entertainment industry, just like our entertainment industry in the West. So, yeah, you know, they, they weren't strangers to working with people from the, you know, other side of the water trade. And, uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of history. And, we, you know, the ukiyo-e prints with the hairstyles like this, you know, you see some of them that were prostitutes. Different, differentiating between a prostitute in ukiyo-e and a geisha in, in uh, ukiyo-e is not so easy for the untrained eye. So, you know, but fortunately in the past 10 years or so, you don't hear many people with, with you know, some people have their doubts, but, you know, they're, they're dealing with it. Sorry, everybody. I had muted my mic. I'm back. Thank you for letting me know. Um, yeah, I'm showing a vintage postcard from your Facebook page right now of the the geisha, Geiko and Maiko. So um, let's talk a little bit about the history that you introduce in your documentary. Um, you start the documentary talking with a hair comb maker. Is that right? He is an artisan in Kyoto. Oh, yeah, he's not the artisan. He's the shop that deals with all the artisans. Yeah. Okay. I haven't for a while, but yeah, he's another another source of my information. We used to sit back in his shop and talk for hours, you know. Um, yeah, so he must be ninety five now. Unfortunately, he closed the shop two years, two or three years ago. Um, he just was tired of working, but uh, yeah, you know, he born and raised in the Gion district and just had stories and, you know. We wouldn't really gossip, but he would tell me how things were in the past, where customers used to study the arts, and even when we did a geisha party together, he brought his harmonica, and he was playing the harmonica at that party. You know, he he felt like he had to participate and not just be like a a customer saying, "Entertain me, let me entertain you." And that's why I think the biggest change in geisha culture is the customer base. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the documentary, um, I am showing a picture of him right now saying. Uh, waitresses in tea houses were asked to entertain customers. And he reckons that's how geisha culture kind of started, or the, the Michael, Michael Geiko culture. Is that right? That was really interesting. Yeah, so. Sorry, what was that question again? Sorry. Um, so in your documentary, he's talking about how um, at first it was a tea house and then it became a oh, drinking yes. house. And then at the drinking house, the customers would ask the waitresses to dance. And that's how uh, geisha culture began. That was yes, interesting. 
yeah, it is, you know, because tea, you know, people even still like, why do they call them tea houses? They don't really serve tea anymore. Oh, yeah, who wants to pay a lot of money just to sit around and drink tea? Um, so, yeah, we went from tea to sake, from sake to entertainment. And, yeah, you know, if you wanted other forms of entertainment, there were those establishments around the corner down the alleyway, if you wanted that. So, you know, they were never the same, you know. And, you know, I wasn't born 250 years ago. I don't know if there are any shady dealings going on. I'm sure there were, you know. I, I'm not to say that nothing ever shady went on in any business, <laughs> you know. You know, because that would just be false. I mean, I wasn't there. I don't know. But, yeah. you know, the tea houses were developed as another option for entertainment other than the brothels. You know, why call it a tea house if it's really a brothel? Like, there is no need to hide it prostitution was legal <laughs> right um i really like in your documentary how you you focus on different women's stories and the title of your documentary is real geisha real women and then watching it you realize the diversity of experiences that different women have had going through the geiko maiko experience um one of the women you start talking with, she had a very sad story about how she was kind of sold or given um, into the industry as a nine-year-old um, because her mother died. That was really powerful. Yeah, and totally came out of the blue. Like, I'd known her. I'd hired her many times. She's such a sweetheart. And uh, you know, I just let her tell her story, like, if you notice my documentary, there's no narration. I just let the women speak, tell their stories. And uh, she said, yeah, well, I've sold at nine. I was like, whoa, okay, did you get that? You know? <laughs> and uh, I didn't have to ask any questions, personal questions. She just was so an open, and just so wonderful and opened up. And, you know, she was 85 at the time, 84, 85. You know, why not tell her story? And, uh, yeah, in the old days, you got to remember, Japan was a very wealthy and very poor country. There's nothing really in the middle. So if you were lived in the countryside and, you know, you had only daughters and they weren't in the fields working, putting food on the table, then sometimes you had to, for lack of a term, get rid of them. And obviously her father was not that great of a guy as I kind of touch in the documentary, you know, he was very selfish. And uh, yeah, there's lots of stories like that. That lady, Miyako-san, such a sweetheart, she passed away about three, four years ago at age 92. She had stopped working for about a year or so because she, just of her health. She was a tiny woman, but she died with all the love of the district around her. I went to the funeral, the service. It was just, you know, I sat in the front row, the only foreigner there freaking out. But, uh, you know, she was very special and uh, not many around like her anymore. Yeah, and in, that's amazing that you have documented her life and her story for other people to enjoy even though she's no longer here and in the movie as well she's talking about being a mentor and taking up and coming um michael up under her wing can you talk about that system a little bit it seems like a very important part of the system yeah well going back to my mentorship as well you know i mean it, it happens in a lot of sports no matter which country you're in and then traditional culture especially in japan you're senpai kohai and in the geisha world uh when a young michael debuts they find them a mentor or a big sister onei-san as they call it and for example mieko-san mieko her younger sister that her mentor that, that the person she chose to mentor her name became miehina so to show respect she took mie from mieko into miehina and they have kind of a Ritual kinship, shall we say, or a ritual lineage. So you have the Mie clan, and you sometimes you have the Mame, Mame Fuku, Mame clan. Sometimes you'll have the Ume, Ume something clan. Um, and you can actually see the family tree if you d d write it out. It's quite a man. So, yeah, I mean, it's a big responsibility to, to decide to mentor someone, you know. But, uh, you know, for example, Mie Hina, who appears in the documentary, she's now 32. I've known her for 16, 17 years, easy. Oh, more than that, 18 years. And she's turned into a wonderful gay cool. We just had her dance at an event two days ago. And she's just such a beautiful dancer. And I've taken her to six countries already. So, 
Yeah, that's amazing. And one of the uh, next women that you focus on in the documentary, she talks about how she had some struggles. Um, she wanted to be a geisha and then she didn't want to be, but then her family wouldn't take her back. So the back and forth between her family and the tea house, that was really powerful. And she ended up opening her own tea house. Yes, I saw her two nights ago. Yeah, I saw her two nights. She's, well, she's not doing that well right now. Well, physically, you know, fine. But financially, the whole geisha districts, are, all the geisha districts are hurting. But yeah, she's doing well. I mean, I've known her, I knew her when she was a geiko from the other house where she was brought up in. She's actually quite tall. She mentions in the documentary, she's about 174 centimeters, which is quite tall. I think there's not been a, I think she's probably the tallest geiko ever at 174 centimeters. So they wouldn't let her become a Michael because she was so tall because the Michael wear these shoes that are like 15 centimeters. So she'd be like six foot two with the hair and everything. So uh, especially in her day, 20, 30 years ago, not many Japanese men were walking around at six foot two. So, um, you know, 185 centimeters, 188 or whatever. But uh, yeah, yeah, so she's still around and I, that's the house I use in that district. And we have a, a very good working relationship. Wow, nice. And then uh, you talk about another woman who uh, wanted to finish high school first. And this comes up a lot in the different stories, how traditionally um, the Maiko or Geiko would start after elementary school. And the, the, the guy in the shop was talking about they were kind of all the girls were separated into different groups who would become a geisha to one one group and then the other group wouldn't become a geisha for girls and if you didn't become a geisha you would be working in factories or be a mother uh get married um but there was a real distinction even at sixth grade of elementary school it's just amazing and then the more modern story, even for her, she's talking about wanting to finish high school and how that was really unusual to finish high school first and then go to geisha training. Is that still the standard even now? Well, in the, I don't know how many years ago when they changed the law, you had the gimu kyoiku, which is the mandatory education, it was only grade six back in the, back in the day. So... You know, if you didn't have a, a route to a higher education, then you had to work. And in those days, being a geisha was a good job. Uh, now it's grade nine, so junior high school. So the earliest you can quit school is after grade nine, so roughly 15, 16. And uh, yeah, but some people realize, you know, with a junior high education, you're not going to get much if the geisha career doesn't work out for you. So some people opt to come after high school. Uh, it's only in Kyoto where you're allowed to become a geisha, a maiko, at 15 years old. In other parts of Japan, they have training geisha called hangyoku or different names for them. Um, and they have to start at 18 after high school, which I think isn't a real bad idea. I understand both trains of thought. Like the younger you get, them, the more you can mold them into someone, you know, a perfect entertainer. I mean, it's funny. When I study flower arrangement, I switched schools and I said, oh, I studied this style of flower arrangement. They said, that's wonderful. Forget it. We're going to teach you how we want you to do flower arrangement. So they want you, like in most Japanese companies as well, they want you to come in as a, you know, a piece of clay so they can shape you. If you come already as a sculpture, they're going to tear it down and re-sculpture you to what they want you to do. So, so um, I understand why they want them to start younger. If they're not pre-sculptured, so to speak. Yeah, interesting. And um, that kind of, it's it, another really interesting point that came up when I was researching your, your excellent website and your documentary is about um, the dedication, that it's not just a day job. It really has to be an all-inclusive part of their life and they need to be fully dedicated to. And uh, that was a real surprise for me. I assumed that in our modern world, they there would be geisha who would just do it as a day job, but it seems like even now, it has to be really a part of their entire life. Is that still true? Well, especially in Kyoto. I mean, there are, other, there are geisha districts throughout Japan, and you know, not to 
you know, say one life's better than another, but in, you know, sometimes it's a part-time job. Sometimes, uh, the situation is they work for a company. It's like a salaried worker in Kyoto. It, it, you're 24 hours. You're part of a union. There are union responsibilities. For example, the other day, all the geisha in Kyoto had to get their COVID tests. You know, they couldn't just not show up because it's part of the union. And, you know, there's behavior. If you misbehave and you, or you do something ridiculous, you know, you have to deal with the members of the union, just like in any corporation or, or family, so to speak. And I think with the mentorship, it, it uh, you know, it, because it makes you more of a family and you can't quit being a family. It's 24 hours, just in any other family. So, you know, don't embarrass your big sister. Don't embarrass your mother of the house. So it's just like a regular family. I don't want to embarrass my relatives or my mother or my, you know, grandparents. So I, yeah, it, it's, it's a real 24 hour gig, so to speak. Yeah. And the, the, one of the women in your documentary who chose to leave and become a mother and start a family, um, that was a really interesting, different kind of story because she was only a geisha for a very short time and then left. Um, she actually met her husband during her performances because he was also connected to the trade. And you also introduced some of the dressers that the geisha are often dressed by men. And that was the first time I'd heard of that. Yeah, I mean, people think, hey, who doesn't, what female doesn't want a, a dresser, you know? A strong guy to tie, tie those obis for you and things. Yeah, wonderful. Unfortunately, he passed away as well. There's a few, two people in that doctor who passed away. Um, yeah, it, it's, you know, having a dresser, it's a, it's a, it's a, fun life for them it's discipline it's fun sorry i'm off track what was what was the main question again um yeah so having men around them um oh, yeah, yeah. one of them ended up marrying a musician who well, yeah yeah so, marrying yeah a lot of people ask me you know why in Kyoto you're not allowed to be a married geisha people say why not well i'll tell you the answer i got from an 80 year old 85 year old geiko many years ago she goes once we marry we're no longer a geisha, and I don't want no dishpan hands. <laughs> wow, that's so, really interesting. Yeah. Um, so even even in these modern times, there are no part-time geisha or part-time Michael. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, and you know, a lot of girls do opt out. You know, there's obligatory contract, you know, periods which they do not want you to quit during that time but after you finish you know you might choose to quit and get married and have a family and if the obligations have been met they'll shake your hand and say thank you very much good luck in life and so a lot of women choose they want families so that might be something that changes in the future to have married geiko michael maybe not michael because they're 15 to 20 but geiko anyway yeah so uh that could be a, a something they'll think about changing in the future yeah interesting um, so anyway, I would highly recommend for people to go and watch the wonderful documentary. Have you thought about making another documentary? That was quite a few years ago. Yes, I started one four years ago, and it's, oh, wow. about, 80, it's about eighty percent done. But it's been in the been in the box for about two and a half years because a lot of things changed overnight and just some some technical issues and just some logistics and things. But uh, you know, a few of the women I'd interview had quit, which is fine because I can in incorporate it. I just need to find a new editor and I'll probably put something out by the end of next year or something. Next year. Just have to find a way how to tie in things I shot four years ago to make it relevant to today. But I think I can. We'll see. So hopefully you'll see something in, out there or, or news of something coming out in the next year or so. That's really exciting. Looking forward to it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the guide and services that you offer to connect visitors to the geisha culture experience. Um, I think this is so necessary because especially with geisha culture, you really need that introduction and you really need someone who can train the customer in the proper etiquette and manners. Mm -hmm. um, you talk a little bit about manners and wasn't there a rule change? 
recently in Kyoto where you're not allowed to photograph them on the streets because of bad manners. Is that right? There's a few signposts in the Geisha district saying don't take them, but how enforceable they are, that's a different story. It's a suggestion with a little bit of a firm hand, but we'll see. I mean, it's just like Japan couldn't enforce Corona reg regulations because of the constitution. It's going to be hard for people to enforce the no photo thing in the Geisha districts. You know, it is public property. <laughs> But for, I think that what they're really concentrating are people standing inside businesses' entrances, entranceways and opening doors and taking photos. That was really the big problem. Of course, chasing the geisha down the street while they're working, you know, but a lot of people around them will actually protect the geisha as well. I mean, they're, I mean, it did get out of hand. But, uh, yeah, the behavior is a big problem out on the streets. I've never had any problems with my guests that I've introduced, that I've taken into uh, restaurants and education entertainment. None of my guests misbehave, of course. And that's one reason why I do a walking tour beforehand. You know, if I get a bad feeling from them during the walking tour before we actually meet the geisha, then it's over. Yeah. Take your money, see you later. You know, I have a reputation to protect and the women to protect. Yeah. So, you know. Well, tell, tell us a little bit about your walking tour. What kinds of things do you introduce? Well, I started in 2002, before anybody was doing it. And I didn't have a guide license, so I had to, I had to deal with a lot of nonsense. A license they actually just got rid of a couple of years ago because they realized what nonsense it was. Um, so I, you know, I just, people were interested in geisha culture and I was lucky enough to be involved in it for, well, 2002 would have been nine years up to then nine or well yeah nine years and i had married into the geisha world my my first wife was part of the geisha world so i had different perspectives and usual people as well and uh yeah i decided i hated teaching english <laughs> so i started a, a walking tour i like being outside i like walking through the beautiful streets i like sharing my knowledge and Fortunately, there are people who wanted me to do that and would pay me for it. So that's how it all started. Yeah, that's great. Um, so in the tour, it sounds like people can see the tea houses um, and the drinking, well, tea houses, which are also the drinking places, but also you point out where they live because most of them are in a boarding house. Is that right? Yeah, so the, you know, I have three parts of the tour, you know, one, two, three. First is just the plain walking tour that people can sign up for. It's so much for the tour per person. And I just take you through the districts. I explain the culture. I try to time it so we might see some of the women moving between engagements. Um, and I talk about the history and point out where they live in the boarding houses and where they go to school and where they entertain. And just go through some beautiful streets having a nice chat. Then the next step up is <clears throat> the same thing, plus going in for drinks into one of my tea houses that I, not my tea, one of the tea houses I belong to as a member. So I'm taking you as a guest and we'll have some entertainment with drinks. Then the uh, other service is dinner, full course, kaiseki dinner included with two geisha to come entertain. So you got ABC course, so to speak, uh, depending on your budget. And uh, well, I don't like the word budget and geisha in the same word. You know, it's like I, I have a hundred dollars, but I want a Porsche. Well, don't say a hundred dollars and Porsche in the same sentence. Um, but yeah, it depends on what you're, how much you are interested in learning about the geisha culture or experience it firsthand. So I try to have something for all groups. You know, it's not cheap if you want an authentic experience. If you want cheap experiences, unfortunately, there are all kinds of places offering that. You know, a lot of ridiculous services out there now. But yeah. unfortunately, the geisha, the geisha don't care. It's business. Because the geisha are not being hired by my customers. They're being hired by me. My customers are hiring me. I'm hiring the tea house. The tea house is hiring the geisha. <laughs> so there's a long chain of who's hiring who. So the geisha will work hard to appreciate to uh, you know, please the tea house. The tea house will find out find the right woman to entertain us to please me, and I'll find I'll find that whole thing together to please my customers. <laughs> so. And then yeah. you you go, if it's a VIP service, for example, drinks or a meal with a geisha, are you also there to help translate and give edit, 
etiquette guidelines and stuff? I'm there all the time. I'm never not with them. There's too much responsibility, too much, you know, you know, I, I like to say, I, I like to think I add to the experience because when the women are around me, I know all of them and they can relax and, you know, they, they don't have to put up this, you know, answer, you know, automatic answered questions, you know, they can relax, literally let their guard down. Some of the older ones might even have a drink and, you know, I had the 80 year old, 85 year old one time dancing around the room like crazy. You know, it was fun, you know. She wouldn't do that with a guide she'd never met, you know, and, you know, and I try to let them know. And, you know, as you mentioned, my, my documentary is called Real Geisha Royal Women. They're women. They like to have fun. They're not porcelain dolls. They're women. They want to have fun. They're entertainers, you know, just sit there and act so prim and proper. And, you know, who wants, who wants that, you know, of course, they're well behaved, you know, having fun and misbehaving doesn't have anything to do with each other. Having fun and being behaved is is a thing you can do, and they do it quite well. That's wonderful. I love that, and I I think it's so important the kind of work that you're doing, and as well as many other travel guides around Japan, um, being able to give the visitor experiences with real locals, but in a well mannered way so that they can un better understand the etiquette and culture, which you have spent so many years developing these relationships and really understanding how to introduce them to the culture in, in a way that's good for the local people as well as the visitors. This is so important with travel in Japan. I agree, you know. I mean, I do my best. I'm still learning, you know. I was just sitting down with me, you know, one of the Geiko sons in the documentary the other day. We were talking, and I, every time I talk to her, I learn how she feels about the world and, you know, her career and what things are going on, you know, so I can share it with my visitors, my guests. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not always right. And I'm, I'm always one to admit when I don't know something and I have to ask. And, you know, I try to give them not my biased opinion, but my educated opinion and uh, hopefully they can like it or not like it i really don't care you know at least i'm giving the information for them to make a educated decision of what they think about it so yeah. you know that's all we that's all we can do if we're in this industry is give them you know the tools to make their own decision on if they like it or if they don't i mean i had a, a german journalist come over and she was six days we spent together photographing interviewing the geisha and she says, Peter, you know what? I really appreciate the women. They're lovely, but I just don't get it. So I said, you know what? You don't have to get it. Just recognize that it exists. And she goes, okay, I get it. I get that part. Yeah. So, you know, she, you know, she realized she didn't have to get it, but she experienced it. So now she can write about it with experience instead of just hearing hearsay or, you know, ridiculous movies and stuff. Yeah. Um, we've had some great comments. Thank you for joining everybody on Facebook, Periscope, and YouTube. Um, you. Marion is asking, how has the geisha culture been changed by modern world? For example, about inclusivity. So, for example, have you had men asking to become geisha? Well, good question. Thank you for the question. The, um, the first geisha were actually men. So, <laughs> if you go back in history... There's still a few performers that they don't call them male geisha. They call them hokan, which are like court jesters, so to speak. Um, modern, no one, I was told, and I've been talking about this, what really killed the geisha culture, not killed it, but put a big dent in it, was the bubble economy and the, the arrival of the electric geisha, a.k.a. karaoke. You know, in, during the bubble economy of the late 70s, 80s, you know, people had money and they didn't want old fashioned entertainment. They wanted new high kara entertainment. So, you know, Japanese business people stopped studying the traditional arts. They wanted to be great karaoke singers. You could take karaoke lessons in Japan now. So um, I think modern, you know, technology changes any traditional anything. You know, soon you'll be, you won't even have a sushi chef anymore. You'll be able to laser cut it, I'm sure. You'll have virtual you know, hologram geisha dancing in the future, I'm sure. So everything's going to change and, you know, culture has to change. It just, does it change with grace or does it disappear 
the way it was? I mean, who knows? I mean, it's not for me to judge. People choose it to make a living, and I want them to make a living. So uh, the biggest thing is, uh, the biggest change is that it's a lot easier to see Geisha now, and some of the ways they're showing it could be done a lot better. Like having them dance in hotel lobbies, I'm not a big fan of. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great. And what you're doing with your guide services is offering access to people on the outside of the culture to learn something about the inside and experiencing it a little bit. What other ways is geisha culture accessible? For example, are uh, dances or songs translated into English or is it wheelchair accessible? Can people who are vegan eat with a geisha, right? So how accessible in, in terms of tourism in the modern age, how accessible is it? Well, it's become very accessible, the tourism in modern age. They're, they offer annual dance recitals, all five districts in Kyoto, where you can, anyone can pay and buy a ticket. Unfortunately, COVID prevented that from happening this year. But uh, yeah, there's wheelchair access. So that's the easiest way. Anyone can buy tickets. And I definitely recommend going to one of the Geisha District's dances in November, uh, March, April, and May, depending on the district in Kyoto. I definitely recommend them. Uh, songs are not really translated into English, but the, if you go to the dances, the program has ex explanations of what's going on. Vegan and things like that, doable, but you know, difficult. Because in Japan, that's one thing people have to realize. When you come to Japan, it's Japan. When you go in a restaurant, they're not your private chef. So if you are vegan, make sure you specify it ahead of time so that people like myself don't have to call the chef 20 minutes beforehand and lose face. Um, but yeah, things are becoming a little bit more flexible these days for vegetarians, vegans. Uh, other religious or dietary restrictions can be met, but don't expect them to be met because you're going to their house, which is their restaurant, and they serve you what they serve you. So people, you know, as geisha districts and other parts of Japan have to become flexible to a guest, guests have to realize they're not at home. So that's one thing you, you can't, this is a, another problem with tourism, I think. So I'm just going to segue a bit, but you can't enable everyone to just say what they want. I want this, I want that. No, things are done a certain way. And if you keep on adopting and adapting to people's needs, selfish needs, then that's how culture disappears, not just by technology, by adapting too much for the buck. You know, and that's what I like about the geisha culture. Things are done this way. If you don't like it, don't come. That's why the whole introduction only uh, system is in place, you know. Yeah, well, that retains authenticity and that retains a sense of pride in the geisha themselves and what they do is taken seriously by customers because they can keep that level of authenticity, which is so important, definitely okay. for heritage and culture. Of course, you know, um, the geisha, yeah. the geisha want, to, and they want their customers to have a great time, so they'll do their best, but you know, don't expect them to bend over backwards you know there there's ways they do things and there's ways people might want them to do it and they won't change and thank god or else that's they wouldn't be what they are now yeah yeah uh richard lowell's thanks for joining from periscope says there are some terrible stories about how foreign tourists have behaved towards geiko in the past you yep. mentioned that a little bit yeah, on the streets, of course, I've seen people chase them down the streets and crowd around them when they're getting into taxis. I heard stories from a girl, someone touched their hair, someone stole a hair ornament. I've heard of customers in a big a VIP party. I didn't see it firsthand, so it's, but it, I got the information secondhand that a customer rolled up a, a wad of cash and threw at her with his hotel room key. And But, you know, to be quite honest, as I said, none of my customers have ever behaved like that. And if they even, if I even got a cent of it, they'd be out of the room in two seconds. So fortunately, knock glass right here, but uh, you know, um, yeah. And to be quite honest, most people don't come to Japan to be rude. You know, a lot of people, you know, want to behave. So I think you've heard a lot of horror stories, but I don't think you hear all the wonderful stories of what a great time and, and what great customers 
they were. You know, the geisha I work with say, Peter, your customers are so great. They're so fun. They're so respectful. And they like working with my customers. So, yeah, there's a lot. I'm not saying you're wrong. There are some horror stories. When me, I heard them. But there are a lot of great stories that don't make it in the news as well. That's wonderful to hear. And I think that's another example of how important a guide is, especially for this kind of authentic culture that you really need as a customer, you really need some guidance. Uh, you can't just walk in and understand etiquette right away. No, and especially, you know, the whole guide license thing was a, a, a problem, but it was a ridiculous license because you had to know a lot about, a little bit about a lot of things, which if you weren't as, you know, I can't tell you how tall Mount Fuji is, and I really don't care. Google it, you know. I think if guides should be registered with the city council so that they know who's taking people around, and you should have some qualifications. Maybe you shouldn't have to take a test or anything, but at least be certified. That way, you know, they know you're paying taxes. And, you know, if something happens, they know who to contact. You know, you have a registration number instead of, you know, a license, so to speak, because, you know, Maybe you're a specialist in sake. Maybe you're a specialist in pavement. Maybe you're a specialist in trees. You know, you can't have a license that covers everything. So if you register with your speciality and, you know, instead of having someone who just can speak English a little and walk around with a flag pointing out nonsense, you know, that's where the problems get involved. Because unfortunately, Japan had went through over tourism where, honestly, if you spoke a little English and you're a Japanese native, you became a guide. Yeah. So I think I've yeah. I've done guide training and uh, I I've had some hurdles to overcome where people want to guide international customers, which is wonderful. But the idea that you're just going to talk at people the whole time about what you know is not really the high quality guide that we are looking for. So I always encourage them to listen, <laughs> which is radical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, listen and, and and experience it you know i wouldn't if someone asked me to take them around kyoto sure i could take them around kyoto you know i know enough about the temples and shrines but i'm not an expert if they want a specialist hire a specialist if they want to learn about geisha culture i would love to take you around you know i can still show you around and keep you from getting lost and take you to good restaurants i know about food and sake and entertainment you know i could entertain you for a day but if you want to really get underneath the surface, maybe I'm not your guy for that. When it comes to geisha culture, I'm your guy. So I think that we have to up our game here, you know, in Japan. And, you know, just don't offer what we think they want. Let's, let's you know, offer them quality. You know, a lot of foreigners now have lived in Japan a long time, but they haven't really lived Japan. And a lot of Japanese who are born and raised in Japan has not have, have lived in Japan their whole life, but they haven't lived Japan. So living in and living Japan, I think, are two different things, you know. You have to pay to study. You have to commit yourself just because you, you can't learn things through osmosis, you know, and then be then expect people to pay you for your services. Absolutely. Um, I love on your Facebook page, Kyoto Sites and Nights, you're introducing a lot of the Geiko or Maiko culture, for example, making the rounds or introducing a new Maiko um, for a tea house. Can you describe a little bit about that? Sure. I do that. I believe it or not, I have like 15 Facebook pages, but the um, better one to look at is Real Geisha Real Women Facebook page because I get a little bit more into depth with that. Kyoto Sites and Nights, of course, I share between faces. So I, I try to post some things that are going on in the districts, especially the past couple of months. There's been a, a few debuts of new Maiko and changing of the collar, as we call it, from Maiko to Geiko. Uh, there's ceremonies where they walk around the streets and do their greetings. So I posted a few photos of those events. And, you know, I just try to keep people in touch with what's going on. I mean, it's not full-on everyday posts, you know, I have, some, I have other things to do with my life than, you know, just update on geisha culture. You know, I do it as a service to give people who are coming to Japan and maybe spark their interest and just give them a little bit of, make them feel like, you know, it, it's a world that's not so off limits, but, you know, kind of show them what's going on. I don't know. It's, it's fun. And I started the project 10 years ago, so you know, I, that'll be a lifelong project, I'm sure. 
Yeah, uh, the picture I'm showing right now, I'm making the rounds, Gion Kobu's newest geiko with uh, Mamekinu san and her dresser during the Ekikai greetings. So, of course, this is one of the things that I've talked to Paprika Girl in the series about is that when I have worn kimono, the few times I've worn kimono, um, if you are walking around, it does come off a little bit or it's not perfect. So having your dresser going around with you, that makes a lot of sense. I didn't realize that. Yeah, and it also, you know, especially if you change your collar, as they say, from Michael to Geiko, you lose the long dangling obi in the back of the Michael, which is seven and a half meters long, and now you're wearing a shorter obi, so you're getting used to the different kimono on that debut day. Also, you're wearing a wig, you're wearing different shoes. A lot of photographers follow you around that day, so you, they need someone to kind of navigate you through the crowds. And yeah, it's very special. And you know, they open the door for you to go in to visit the the proprietresses or the proprietors of the uh, establishments you frequent. And uh, yeah, it's it's you know, it's kind of nice having a chaperone take you around. I'm sure, having being followed by photo photographers. Who are also quite well behaved. Sometimes they get in the way, but yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of a Hollywood experience, I think, for the women. That, you know, uh, how has uh, geisha culture been impacted by coronavirus? Has it Oof. adapted in a way to keep customers and them themselves safe? Has it slowed? Well, yeah. unfortunately, unfortunately, it's hit very hard. Um. You know, COVID unfortunately hits people in their, you know, late 60s, 70s, 80s a lot harder than maybe younger people. I mean, it, of course, it affects everybody. But a lot of the clientele is older clientele and from outside of Kyoto. So traveling to, to come to Kyoto is, first of all, difficult because of the travel restrictions. They just today, they just stopped the go to travel campaign and postponed it for a couple of weeks. And uh yeah, and, you know, geisha entertainment usually involves sake. So when people drinking, people speaking louder voices, droplets fly. So they're wearing masks, holding little fans in front of their, uh, you know, what do you call it, acrylic fans in front of their faces, distancing, no drinking games where they'd be sharing cups. And, and then they tried some online services, which, you know, it's a different experience. Not a whole lot of it going on in Kyoto and other parts of the rural parts of Japan, like the Hakone, um, sorry, yeah, the Hakone Geisha offer online Geisha parties, which is wonderful. I know a few of them. So it's changed. And unfortunately, you know, December, which is Bonenkai season with, you know, the end of the year parties, they're gone now. So they're, yeah, they've been hit really hard, you know, and then if they're hit very hard, that means that I can't offer services. But if I don't have clients that are coming in the country, I can't offer the services to help them either. So I feel really bad when I walk down the streets and I see the women, the, the Michael Geiko that I know, they're like, oh, hello, Peter. How's business? Hint, hint. I'm like, oh, you know, I wish I could hire you, all of you, but uh, I can't. So, yeah, it's kind of tough walking around the district, seeing people all dressed up and no place to go, literally. You know, they have to get dressed up every day just in case there are some clients. Wow. Yeah, I, I would imagine because the experience of in-person experience is so important for what they do. Um, it's It'd be a really hard transition to just online entertainment or not having the customer to uh, host experience. Uh-oh, we've uh, dropped dropped your feed a little bit. Maybe he'll be able to join back. Um, Marion says, I love your concept of guide registration. Excellent idea. Thanks for joining, Marion. Uh, we've had so many great comments. We've only got a minute left and we've dropped Rich uh, Peter. Oh no. Let's see if I can get him back just for the last couple minutes. Peter. Let's see if we can get him back. Fingers crossed, everyone. What an interesting talk. I've learned so much about geisha culture. There's a lot of things I hadn't realized 
uh, one of the biggest takeaways for me was how um, even now in their modern lives, they have to do it 24 seven, that it's not just a day job, that they can have a different life after work. That was a big takeaway for me. Oh no, we can't connect with Peter. Uh, we'll have to stop it there for today. Um, thank you everybody for joining. And thank you so much, Peter, um, for sharing your insights. Please have a look at his Facebook pages. Um, you can connect with Real Geisha, Real Women on YouTube. You can watch the documentary on his YouTube channel. I'll put all the links below. Um, also, on his website, petermckenzie.com, um, he has links to all of his work. So please have a look when you have a chance. And I think we'll end it there. Thank you so much for joining everyone. Thank you so much, Peter. Hopefully connect with you again some other time. Maybe we can do another talk with Peter. Oh, here he is. Okay, uh, let's just see if we can get Peter at the end to say goodbye. Fingers crossed. Hi, Peter, are you there? There he is. Okay, Hi. good. Hi. Yeah, we, we lost you just at the end. I'm um, sorry. Well, this no, is why you, no. this is why technology. Right, this, this is why geisha parties online don't work. <laughs> technology. We love it, but we hate it. Um, yeah, thank you so true. much for joining, Peter, and sharing all your insights. It was such an interesting talk, and I learned so much, and we had some great comments and questions along the way. So keep up the good work, and maybe um, in about six months after coronavirus, hopefully, is more under control, and you might have some progress on your new documentary, as well as um, new insights post-corona travel and geisha culture. Maybe we can do another talk. That'd be wonderful. That would be wonderful. And thank you for having me. And enjoy the holidays and be safe and keep healthy. And I look forward to watching more podcasts of yours. Thank you. Yeah. Thank this everyone is... for tuning in. Yeah. This is a great time to try this kind of project online and be able to hear from experts like you around Japan. So thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Take care. Uh, tomorrow, 9 a.m., we're talking with the sake mistress, Simone Maynard, who's in Australia, but she's done a talk show series with lots of toji from around Japan, sake masters. So join us again tomorrow morning. Thank you so much, Peter. Have a good Thank day. You. Bye. See you.